The abundances of the elements is a key topic in astronomy and just a really great story because we have a model of what goes on in the cores of stars very far away from here and it matches so nicely the evidence we have all around us in terms of how common or rare different elements are. It ties all of our models of the lives and deaths of stars together and ties it to the stuff that we are made out of. Here's how it works. I'm going to skip the basic definitions of the different kinds of nuclei and so on. You can catch those in my video on Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. That video also explains the abundances we expect coming out of the Big Bang, which are a lot of hydrogen, so very high up in this plot. Hydrogen being about three-fourths of the total, helium being the next most common, about one-fourth of the total, and trace amounts of the next few heavier elements such as lithium and beryllium, but very trace amounts. This is a logarithmic plot, so lithium is millions of times more rare than hydrogen and helium. Anything to the right word of lithium in this plot is going to be made by stars and not coming out of the Big Bang. So let's see how that works. To understand how that works, let's look at the energies represented by these different nuclei. And so as I draw this plot, think about it being the profile of a bicycle race, where going downhill releases energy and going uphill requires a lot of input energy. So to go from hydrogen to helium releases a lot of energy. To go to the next heaviest element, lithium, actually requires an input of energy. And so stars don't do that. Instead, the next logical step is to produce carbon, which releases energy and can be made by just taking three helium nuclei and smashing them together and hoping that they stick and you get all the ingredients necessary for carbon. Now, most stars that are not very massive can do, reach the temperature required to make carbon only at the very late stages of their lives, and they never go beyond that stage. But really massive stars reach the temperatures required to go beyond carbon, and they basically keep adding more helium nuclei to the carbon. So if you add one helium nucleus to carbon, you get oxygen, which is just a little bit further downhill than carbon. Now, you'll notice there's an odd numbered element in between, which is nitrogen, and that actually requires going uphill. So not much nitrogen is made. And again, if you add a helium to an oxygen, you get, um, what do you get? You get neon. And neon is a little bit more downhill than oxygen. And there's a little bit of an uphill in between, which is fluorine. And after neon, it sort of starts to make a nice smooth curve downhill. You can make all kinds of stuff and get a little bit of energy out of each step until you get to the bottom of the hill, which is iron. And then more massive elements start requiring an input of energy to make. So in equilibrium, you would expect stars to just stop at iron. That's the bottom of the hill. But we actually do see elements beyond iron all the way to uranium, right? Those are made out of equilibrium. When the massive star runs out of energy and is facing collapse, there's a supernova explosion, and that returns all of these elements back to the interstellar medium, which is why we can measure them. They're not locked away in the core of the star. But that explosion also does something else, which is it slams a lot of lighter nuclei into the iron nuclei, and together they make the heavier nuclei. So they're made out of equilibrium. All right, so what does this mean for our prediction of abundances? Let's go back to this plot. So we expect a lot of carbon and a lot of the even numbered elements, oxygen, neon, I might be skipping some, but there's magnesium and silicon and so on. And very little of the odd numbered elements in between. Not very little, but relatively little. So there's less nitrogen than carbon or oxygen. And there's definitely less fluorine than oxygen or neon, and so on. You get this sawtooth pattern. This continues all the way to um, iron. There's quite a bit of iron made in the cores of massive stars. And then beyond iron, you get, you get a rapidly declining abundance, but you do again get this sawtooth pattern because you can slam multiple 
helium nuclei into iron and get all these even numbered elements, you're relatively less likely to get the odd numbered elements. So this is just a schematic drawing. A detailed scientific model would include the fact that sometimes you make heavy elements that are unstable and they decay back this way to slightly less heavy elements. And the models of astronomers do include all those details. And how do those models stack up with actual measurements? Well, here's a plot, courtesy of Wikipedia. And you see that uh, all these features match. I've only described them qualitatively, but in a quantitative model they match quite well. Now, you'll notice that these abundances are not the same as here on Earth, because Earth does not have enough mass to hold on to its light elements, hydrogen and helium. But beyond those light ones, this is more or less the same as on Earth. To, so to, to obtain a really fair sample, astronomers go out and measure this in a representative sample of interstellar gas and stars and so on. Okay, so this is an amazingly detailed prediction for a model and it matches the data extremely well. So this is a triumph for the model. But it's more than that. The story is about us as well. Because if you think about this model, what it says is that all the carbon, all the oxygen, all the iron and so on in our bodies was actually made in massive stars very far away which, when they went supernova, returned those elements to the interstellar medium so that when the solar system was formed, they were incorporated in our bodies. So, this is a real triumph for the scientific model, but it's also just amazing to think about in personal terms.